Ladies and gentlemen, um, may I interrupt your conversation and suggest everyone sits down if you're not sitting down. My, my name is Vernon Moore. I'm a trustee of the Asia Society, and I'd like to welcome you all very much indeed to the Asia Society Hong Kong Center here in Hong Kong. I don't know if uh, everyone has visited it, but uh, you should do so. This is a modern part of the building, but up the hill we have some very old historic sites which the Asia Society um, reconstructed and renovated over the last few years. Now, of course, in particular, uh, I'd like to uh, very welcome very much Mr. Amitav Ghosh and indeed also uh, Ms. Uh, Xu Shi to, uh, to uh, visit us tonight because they are the stars. Uh, Mr. Ghosh in particular is going to talk um, in this moderated conversation on the subject of a life of letters the craft and vision in writing. Uh, now, I'm sure all of us have to write something. Personally, I've only written reports in a business. But somebody was telling me earlier that inside every person is the desire to write a book. And today, we have um, two people with us who are real experts at writing books. Uh, Mr. Ghosh, who was, was um, born in uh, um, uh, um, Kola, I forget the modern name now, Kota, Kokata, and uh, grew up in India, Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka. He has written many books, and these books have received uh, a great deal of accolades and awards. Uh, you can see them listed on the paper which is in front of you. Uh, he has um, sat on the panels for film festivals, he has lectured and, uh, in the finest universities, and um, he is uh, somebody from whom we can learn a terrific amount uh, today. And um, the moderator today is also a writer, and I understand they've known each other for a very long time, Ms. Xu Shi. She has written over 10 books, and um, uh, she is uh, living between Hong Kong and uh, New York, according to this. So you, um, Ms. Uh, Ms. Xu, you uh, are certainly somebody who Cathay Pacific, who have just announced rather poor results, which is to encourage. <laughs> so um, with, with that said, and um, I'd like to invite Mr. Ghosh and uh, Ms. Xu to the podium here um, so we can begin the conversation which is going to go on for the next 90 minutes. So please. Thank you very much and good evening. It's wonderful to be here. I will do a brief introduction today for Amitav and then invite him to the stage. So it is a great privilege for me to introduce him. He's an author I've long admired and look forward very much to our conversation. So I could tell you about all the awards and accolades he's won or that since he published his first highly acclaimed novel at the age of 30, that he's published seven more novels and six nonfiction titles or that his work has been translated into over 20 languages. But you probably all know this already, or you can read about it yourself. Instead, what I'm going to tell you is this. Amitav Ghosh is that very rare being, an artist and thinker who is both a reader's writer and a writer's writer. If you've read any of his novels, you'll know that once you get started, you're trapped and cannot stop till you've turned every page till the end. That's true for me, actually. For that matter, the same is true of his nonfiction. His latest book is a nonfiction titled The Great Derangement. It's an astonishing, persuasive, beautifully crafted argument that dramatizes the tragedy of climate change. It also demands that we recognize how all of us, and especially those of us who write fiction, um, are complicit in perpetuating an existentialist nightmare because of our inability to collectively address the onslaught of climate change on our planet. But despite this rather bleak and even nihilistic message, Gosh work is beautiful in its transformative power. Not only is his language stunningly precise, and his insights brilliant in their originality, the story he tells is confrontational, challenging the reader to not look away, to be, as the writer Elizabeth Colbert says of his work, as unflinching as he when faced with the urgency and truth of what he has to say. And yes, it was a book that I, both as a reader and writer, simply could not put down. 
So today, it's indeed our pleasure to welcome him back to Hong Kong and hear him talk about his life and letters, as well as his craft and vision in writing. Please join me in welcoming to the stage the novelist and writer Amitav Ghosh. Okay, so I thought I'd start with the life and letters. Let's talk about that. Because as a young man, you said that you knew you wanted to be a writer when you were in your 20s. And I think you very much, it was evident that you set about meeting this goal quite seriously. So I wanted to talk to you about an essay you wrote about Satajit Ray, the filmmaker, who was an early creative influence on you and whom you admired. And here's something you said about him, that he was not just a great artist. He was something even rarer, an artist who crafted his life that could serve as an example to others. So in your own life in letters, what kind of writer and artist have you wanted to be or tried to be? Did you try to emulate Ray? That's a very good question, Shushi. But uh, let me first uh, thank you for that very generous and uh, introduction. Uh, generous and insightful. <laughs> thank you. And uh, my thanks also to the Asia Society, the consulate for, um, for setting this up. It's, I, I, I've done a, an event at the Asia Society before, but it was before they had this amazing space, and it's really quite incredible. So it's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you all for coming. Um, Satyajit Ray, yes, Satyajit Ray had a very, very powerful influence uh, uh, on my thinking, um, uh, on my way of seeing. Uh, something that far sort of uh, exceeds that of uh, a film director, really. I mean, I really felt that I learned to see the world through his eyes, you know. And that was because Satyajit Ray himself was very embedded within a sort of Bengali literary tradition, you know. So, uh, especially he, his work is so profoundly influenced by uh, Tagore. So he had this, he had a certain way of looking at the world which uh, did really very much uh, influence me. But more than that, you know, one of the really great things about Satyajit Ray is that as, uh, as an artist working in Asia, working in a very troubled part of Asia, he managed to be productive for uh, decade after decade. I mean, a very few artists uh, have really been as productive as he has and as productive at an incredibly high level, you know. And I remember, uh, you know, when, when I was in my 20s uh, reading something that he had said, you know, which is that sometimes you just have to be able to shut the door. Because, uh, you know, in India especially, there is so much happening all the time. There's some outrage, some abuse somewhere. And your first temptation is to respond to that. Your first temptation is to go and walk, a, you know, join a demonstration, sign a protest, uh, join things all the time. And it's somehow sort of very important to remind yourself of what your fundamental commitments are, uh, to be able to continue with your own discipline, you know. So, in all those ways, yes, uh, Satyajit Ray did have a very powerful influence on me. You said something else about him, too, that um, I found very interesting. In a world where people in the arts are often expected and even encouraged to be unmindful of those around them, he was exemplary in his dealings with people. And you went on to say that he refused to make a fetish of himself. Um, I was curious why you found this aspect of Ray interesting. And do you think that writers and artists today make a fetish of themselves? Absolutely. They make a fetish of themselves. They make a fetish of art. Yeah. And I'll tell you uh, uh, what really prompted me to say that. Uh, you know, uh, Satyajit Ray was once uh, making a film and he was taking an overhead shot. And uh, something happened and the light fell and it killed a cameraman or, or it killed someone who was working on his set. And uh, he was so shocked and traumatized by this uh, that he said that he would never again do an overhead shot of that kind, and he never did. And what really struck me was at exactly the time that I was reading this, I was also reading about Werner Herzog, uh, you know, who's a, also a, a great filmmaker in his own way. Uh, he made the, um, Aguirre, The Wrath of God, uh, which some of you will have seen, one of the great masterpieces. But in making Aguirre, The Wrath of God, uh, or maybe it was a later film that he made, some 20 or 30 people on his uh, set died. You know, and uh, he was, uh, what he said is that this is the price of art. And, uh, you know, to me, that is so completely unconscionable, you know. And I mean, uh, um, uh, Ray's vision, the, his way of working, his way of thinking about his art was 
so much more humane to me, you know, that, uh, you know, I think one of the first lessons of a Gandhian point of view is that the end never justifies the means. The means is the end. You know, I mean, so nothing good can result from a way of making something which is in itself inhumane. And I think that was really, for me, the lesson of, uh, of Ray's life. Um, you also talked about his storytelling ability, that he was able to distill a very complicated plot to the, to the essence. Um, is, is that something that you, you've tried to sort of do yourself, do you feel? Yes, I think Ray was very, uh, you know, he worked a lot with, uh, uh, with literary novels, with difficult literary novels. And he had this great talent of being able to reduce, uh, not reduce, uh, reduce is a, is, is a bad word, I think, of being able to distill, as you say, uh, you know, very complex uh, plots to something which, is, uh, uh, which works on the screen. But I must say that uh, he did this with uh, uh, books written by some friends of mine, Bengali writers, and uh, they were livid. <laughs> they hated it. <laughs> they all said, you know, he's completely destroyed my book. And, you know, I wanted to tell some of them that, you know, his film is so much better than your book. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know. That might be a problem, though. But, yes. <laughs> but your own novels, I think one of the things that's interesting to me about the craft of your work is um, you, you seem to have a love of storytelling. Um, your first novel, The Circle of Reason, that was praised by critics as Dickensian. Um, and the third novel, The Calcutta Chromosome, which is a sort of sci-fi work, um, a scientific thriller. Um, and you take on very serious subjects in your novel. And I, I think it's, it's fair to say that many of your works would be what we call novels of ideas as well. But you still manage to spin a great yarn. So my question is, how do you do it? Um, the answer is simple, really. I think, um, you know, the reason I'm a novelist rather than uh, say something else is because I'm interested in, uh, in people, uh, you know, in people's lives, their, uh, their stories, their histories, the experiences that make them into the people that they are. And I think, uh, you know, uh, just as uh, Clinton used to have this sign on the wall, uh, you know, when he was running for president, and the sign said, uh, it's the economy, stupid. So I think uh, every novelist should have a sign on their wall saying, it's the people, stupid. <laughs> you know, because that's really what it's about. So it is people, the characters that you write about. But what about the plot? Because how consciously do you plot when, you, when you're working on a novel? Uh, I don't plot at all in that, uh, in that way. Uh, you know, I, I know of many writers who have these elaborate storyboards, uh, who, uh, you know, write out their story long before they, um, they actually come to it. Uh, I work in a very labor-intensive way. I slowly take the character forward and, you know, try and explore the various paths that they could go down and, you know, which ends up with sort of throwing away, you know, maybe two-thirds of what I write. But, you know, so in that way, I try and feel my way forward, trying to, uh, trying to find out, you know, which movement is true, which movement uh, is convincing to me about the character's life. And out of that, a plot emerges, you know. So for me, a plot is not something that, uh, you know, I uh, sort of uh, uh, fit my writing into. A plot is something that emerges organically out of the process of exploration, does that exploration also help you in terms of, because I think in many of your novels, you're, you're trying to make a very serious point, whether it's political or scientific or, or whatever the case may be. Does it help you too in terms of the ideas you're trying to put across over and above the story that you're trying to tell? That's a good question. Uh, I don't really uh, know how to answer it, actually. Because, uh, you know, I think what's interesting about a novel, as opposed to writing journalism or writing nonfiction, is that you can explore different aspects of an idea, you know? If you're writing, say, advocacy, or if you're writing philosophy or whatever, you're writing, uh, uh, you're advocating one point of view. But the great thing about a novel is that you can explore multiple points of view. You know, you can explore an idea or you can explore an event through all these different points of view. That's what makes the novel such an interesting form, uh, you know, in, in my opinion. So... I would never say that I would that I write something only to, as it were, put forward one point of view. To me, what's interesting about writing a novel is exactly this: the multifacetedness. You know, to be able to present uh, an event in the round, if you like. 
Um, so which novel did you enjoy writing most? <laughs> I think if, if you're going to talk about pure enjoyment, the one that I really enjoyed uh, in the sense that it was like a kind of delirious thing uh, was uh, the Calcutta chromosome. Ah. <laughs> and it's called, uh, you know, a novel of uh, fevers and delirium. Mm -hmm. And it was really like that. I mean, it just emerged out of this state of, you know, I'd had... Uh, the, uh, the book, The Calcutta Chromosome, is really about malaria, of all things. But I'd had malaria. And uh, anyone who's had malaria will tell you that malaria is a really like... A, uh, it, it's like a hallucinogenic experience, you know, uh, it's this strange sort of out of body uh, experience. And after it was over, I mean, you know, you see these visions, you see these sort of bright colors and all sorts of extraordinary things. So afterwards, uh, you know, it just sort of came pouring out of me. Isn't writing a novel a hallucinatory experience anyway, most yes. of the time? I yes. find it. I completely agree. I mean, uh, writing is exactly that. It's, a, uh, it's an out-of-mind experience. Every single day, you're transported into some, <laughs> some sort of space, which is not normalcy. <laughs> what about the characters? I mean, you have to live with these characters for a lot, but your, your books often have a very vast sort of cast of characters. How do you keep them all straight? How do you, how do you deal with them as you're imagining them over a period of time? I wish I could say that there's a, that there's a trick to it, you know. Uh, and I know that some writers do have these storyboards. They do have, uh, you know, sort of uh, elaborate notes and so on. But for me, really, in, at the end of the day, it's all in my head. Uh, I just try and keep it in my head and I try and move forward. I've, st I've tried doing all that stuff, you know. But it's never worked for me. Uh, I, I, you know, I lose the bits of paper or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, so for me, uh, at the end of the day, it's all in my head. And sometimes I, I, I mix it up. And then I hear from the readers, you know. <laughs> <laughs> What's the worst error your readers have ever picked up on your, on, on your work? Um, I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> 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 okay. <laughs> Let that be a secret. <laughs> let's, let's talk about the vision that guides your writing. And, and I wanted to turn to history because in the IBIS trilogy which are your three most recent books. Um, that's the period leading up to the first Opium War and also the impact on the people of Bihar and the Bay of Bengal. And it's a very highly political subject in many ways. So let's start with the question of politics. Do you consider yourself a political novelist or writer? Um, no, not, not in any straightforward sense. Again, as I said, you know, to me what is really interesting is to explore various facets uh, of an event, you know, to sort of try and see, uh, you know, what it did in its sort of entirety. And especially with this, and it's so interesting to be sitting here talking about, uh, talking about the trilogy in Hong Kong, because really it ends with the day that Hong Kong was literally founded, you know, when they had the, big, the first big sale of land, and most of the land was bought by Indians, Parsis, you know. Uh, the a single biggest buyer of land uh, was, a, uh, was a family in, uh, from Bombay. I wonder where their lands have gone now. <laughs> it's kind of hard to know. But yeah, it is. Uh, uh, so I wouldn't call myself uh, a political in that sense. And actually, I'm, uh, uh, you know, I'm sort of troubled by the whole idea of politics in literature. Because I think invariably when... Uh, people talk about politics and literature, it ends up almost invariably being a sort of discussion of not politics really, but something that you might call morality or, you know, something like that. So it becomes a kind of moral philosophy uh, from which I certainly would want to dis uh, distance myself, yes. So if you had to define a vision or worldview that guides your writing as a novelist or the, 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 what you're trying to do in your novels, what would that be? I would say in the most fundamental way, I, I hope, I think what I'm trying to explore is uh, a set of relations which is ultimately beyond uh, those of uh, what we conceive of as, uh, as politics, at least in a, in a normal or everyday sense. I'm trying to think of uh, you know, people as they are in relation to each other, in relation to time, and also in relation to the earth. Uh, you know, how they respond, how they interact uh, with their surroundings. So, you know, beginning with the circle of reason onwards, uh, all my books have uh, really be, had, had this very important focus upon 
the ways in which the, the natural world, if we can call it that, the ways in which the natural world interacts with our bodies, our minds. So, for example, malaria. Yes. <laughs> what you also refer to as the non-human side. Of as the non-human, yes. yes. Okay. yes. Um, but history, why are you so compelled by history for your fiction? I mean, it takes an awful lot of research to write a historical novel like you, you have. Isn't the contemporary world sufficiently engaging? <laughs> Look, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm a, I'm a middle-aged uh, Indian man, almost, uh, I mean, I would say elderly, certainly. <laughs> Not quite. <laughs> well, how would one actually, how, how would a person in my circumstance actually write about the here and now? You know, I, I have kids. I, my, my children go out to discotheques and they live in the here and now. So I know that I don't live in the here and now. You know, that's a very, that's a very useful thing about having children. They teach you that you are old, you know, <laughs> and that you don't know about what they know about. So that's a salutary lesson, uh, you know, in a sense. So I think, uh, uh, you know, that, uh, to me, there's something sort of rather weird, if, you, if I may say so, uh, about uh, writers of my age and generation when they do try to write about the here and now, because often they simply don't know. And you can tell that they don't know, you know. Whereas the past, yes, that's something I do know. And that's something I can look into, and I have the skills to look into it. And, I, uh, you know... Uh, that's something I enjoy. I, I enjoy the research. The research is, some, is actually deeply pleasurable to me, you know, because apart from everything else, writing is for me, actually, it wouldn't be worth it if it weren't rewarding for me, you know, and uh, th that's what's been really incredible about writing the, uh, the Ibis trilogy, just this discovery of this entire world, which I didn't even know existed, you know, which came into being through these trade exchanges through opium, through these exchanges of people, through the coming of uh, Indians into China, into, through the uh, travels of uh, Chinese to South Asia. So it was this discovery of this amazingly cosmopolitan world. You know, and that cosmopolitan world had its center where I was yesterday, which is Guangzhou. You know, Guangzhou was the world's great cosmopolitan center. It was in, its, in the early 19th century, it was a greater city than uh, London, Paris, Rome. It's, Guangzhou is older than Rome. You know, and in this city, there came into being this, uh, this extraordinary cosmopolitan culture. You know? And I, th I personally believe that this culture really profoundly changed the culture of the world. And uh, you know, after the Second Opium War, essentially Guangzhou was uh, erased. You know? And, and this whole culture was effectively raised because, you know, what was so interesting about Guangzhou in that period is that it was a cosmopolitan, it, it, it was a kind of cosmopolitanism which was not sponsored by the West. You know, it was an Asian cosmopolitanism. It was a place where uh, Asians and Europeans and Chinese could meet on more or less equal terms. So it was completely different from anything that existed in the 19th century. Uh, you know, in other parts of the world. But after 1856, what, it, what, was replaced, what replaced Guangzhou is actually Hong Kong or Shamin Island in Guangzhou, which are actually just completely colonial settlements, you know, where it's very clear who the master is and, uh, you know, Asians are certainly excluded from that. So I think we have this brief and brilliant moment in Guangzhou in the early 19th century, uh, which radiates outwards in so many directions bringing all these extraordinary cultural exchanges into view, you know, exchanges of, um, of these botanical exchanges, zoological exchanges, uh, exchanges of ideas, exchanges of visual forms. Uh, and, uh, you know, nobody's actually tracked the way that these exchanges changed India, for example. So it was, doing this research was so profoundly interesting. I mean, it was much more, to come back to your question, it was much more interesting to me than going out and exploring, say, <laughs> a discotheque or whatever. They're not that interesting in New York, anyway. Um, so where in history are you looking at now? Um, well, you know, I've just published this book, The Great Derangement, which is actually about um, uh, climate change. And I think climate change really represents to us in many ways, the end of history, <laughs> you know, in multiple senses, that is, 
what history is, is heading towards, and also the sense in which history itself becomes meaningless when every event encompasses within it everything that has preceded it. Well, let's talk about The Great Derangement, because that, that's a, an, a very interesting book. It's, um, it's certainly a book that seems to be advocating uh, a certain idea um, about the problems of climate change. Um, and I'll just share with the audience some of the reviews uh, about it. One in The Wire called it a book of both passion and finesse. And the reviewer says that one of the conclusions that The Great Derangement leads you towards, but which you have to explore on your own, is that in a period of crisis, not everything is important. Few things probably are. This book is important in part because it dares to remind us that importance is not to be ceded too freely. And in Live Mint, the reviewer said that you write with surgical accuracy and that you disentangle the knots of the wicked problem that is climate change. And I quite like what he had to say here. It charts our progress, our cultures, history and politics and its environmental fallout as delicately and firmly as a Buddhist monk resolutely scattering colored sand to create a mandala. So the crisis of climate change that serious literature, especially the novel, fails to address, um, you contrasted it, it, you know, sort of the mansions of serious fiction don't really deal with the subject and that it only is in the outhouses of sci-fi and fantasy that we see anything to do with climate change. Um, well, you're a novelist, but you elected nonfiction to talk about this. I, I realize that these were a series of lectures, um, rather than attempt a novel that might make it into the mansion in serious fiction. Why? Well, I am. Um, uh, it goes without saying, I am attempting to do that in fiction as well. So, you know, many of these thoughts, many of these ideas uh, came to me because I've, um, I, uh, I was struggling with climate change. I was struggling with, you know, the sorts of philosophical and narrative challenges that climate change poses, you know, especially to, to our craft, you know, as novelists. I mean, it makes you... It forces you to examine, uh, as it were, the assumptions and presumptions of our craft, you know. Why is it that we fail to deal with phenomena that, uh, you know, our predecessors dealt with very easily? That is to say, the writers of great epics, the writers of, uh, say, the Monkey King journeys to the West, um, you know, uh, they were able to address issues of this kind in a way that we are not. You know, so that becomes the question for me that, you know, why do we struggle uh, uh, with our forms, with our forms of narrative, our ways of telling stories that, uh, you know, why is it that these phenomena are so difficult for us? This is a problem of the Anglosphere. This is something you talked about, you know, Updike's insistence on the individual moral adventure, uh, something that would be the characteristic of a successful novel. It's certainly the way that the English, uh, that the novel has gone in the English-speaking world, but it need not have, you know. I mean, uh, you know, for me, the great, the, the very greatest novelist really is Herman Melville. And in Moby Dick, we see, uh, you know, uh, such a sort of uh, dealing with uh, the non-human, you know, at, at every level. I mean, for, for Melville, uh, the whale is not really an animal. I mean, you can see that the whale... Uh, has the same demonic uh, ferocity as Captain Ahab, you know. Again, uh, you know, the Pequod as a ship, he's writing about the collective. So, uh, you know, what actually happens is that it's, it's in this post-war era. It's in exactly the era that we start, uh, you know, emitting greenhouse gases on a massive scale that our imagination becomes completely wedded to the idea of this individual um, moral adventure. So what's the solution? Do we write fantasy? Do we write sci-fi? You call those the outhouses of, of literature? No, uh, I think that exactly is the problem. I mean, I just read uh, yeah, today a paper in the, in the newspaper. There was, a, there was an article about uh, American uh, climate change denial. And it said in large parts of the American South, people think climate change is the same thing as extraterrestrials and Martians. And this is why. It's because climate change is treated as a, a separate genre, because it's treated as science fiction. But climate change is not science fiction. It's happening here, now. You know, uh, just last year, 2015, if you think of these epic deluges 
uh, that we had in Chennai, for example, in India, that is Madras. In 2005, there was this epic deluge in, uh, uh, in Bombay. You know, uh, I'm sure you'll have seen that in Louisiana, uh, just today, uh, 30 inches of rain has essentially paralyzed this entire state, killed dozens of people, billions of dollars lost. If you compare that with what happened in Mumbai in, uh, um, uh, in 2005, it was almost 40 inches of rain within 24 hours. You know, here, 30 inches of rain over three days. Uh, it, in Mumbai, it was 40 inches of rain over, uh, over 24 hours. I mean, one of the highest rainfall totals ever. And the damage uh, is still, uh, you know, it, it's inconceivable. I mean, what it did to that city. Now, you sit here, uh, sit here and think of what would happen to Hong Kong. You know, if you had, uh, as you will have, either a cyclone of, a, you know, a superstorm like Sandy, or you have this rain bomb event uh, happening over here. How do you drain a city? You know, if you have uh, 40 inches of rain in 24 hours, you can't, especially a city which is essentially should not be inhabited. I mean, that's what the Qing Dynasty people felt, you know, when the British officials went and asked for Hong Kong. They said, there? You want to build there? Are you crazy? <laughs> and, uh, you know, you have this here, but it's a sitting duck. Uh, for climate change. So is your book sort of issuing a challenge to all fiction writers to address the question of climate change in a serious novel? No, I would never uh, presume to tell other writers what they should write about. I think uh, writers should write what, uh, you know, what they want to write. But, you know, there have been writers who've, uh, who've written about climate change very persuasively. Barbara Kingsolver is a wonderful writer. She's written a great novel about climate change called uh, Flight Behavior. Uh, Liz Jensen has written a very fine novel again. So the, the whole question for me is that it should not be in a separate genre, you know? It should be, uh, we should be able to address these issues as the reality of our lives, which in fact they are. You know, you think of Wordsworth, etc., sitting in the Lake District talking about, you know, uh, how, uh, you know, in daffodils. this elegiac, uh, yes, daffodils and this elegiac view of nature. And then, uh, you know, you remember those epic floods which almost swept away the Lake District. So everywhere in the world, you know, we are dealing with this now. Uh, and uh, we have to recognize that it's not tomorrow. It's not going to happen in some, uh, you know, some distant future. It is happening to us now. It's a part of the reality of our lives. Is nonfiction perhaps the better genre dealing to deal with it? I don't know that nonfiction is an answer either. You know, I was recently in... Uh, I think the problems that fiction... Uh, faces in relation to uh, climate change are actually extendable to nonfiction as well. And I'll give you an example, not just nonfiction, to all the arts. Uh, I was just in Delhi, and Delhi, uh, you know, uh, last month had this unbelievable heat wave where uh, temperatures literally touched 49 degrees Celsius, you know. So, I mean, you could actually cook, you know, just by leaving your pan outside. Um, so uh, they asked me to meet a group of uh, young journalists, uh, and they were very bright young journalists. And I asked them, uh, I said, how many of you wrote about this heat wave? And none of them did. Because how do you write about a heat wave? What's the story? You know, what's the story in a heat wave? How do you write about it? Similarly, you know, if you look at uh, the, the Mumbai deluge, again, it's an epic deluge. It, uh, you know, it uprooted thousands of people. It created trauma for hundreds of thousands of people. Yet, uh, and Mumbai is a city which has uh, one of the world's largest film industries, uh, many, many writers, artists. Yet, uh, there's not a single important short story or novel uh, about the deluge. There's not a single important film about it, not a single significant film about it. Uh, and I met these, uh, uh, you know, two old friends, artists, uh, two of India's greatest artists, in fact. I'm sure you'll know them, Amna. <laughs> Uh, husband and wife couple. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, I was talking to them about this deluge and they said to me that uh, their lives had been completely upended by, uh, by this rainfall event. Water had swamped their house. They'd lost a lot of paintings. Uh, for two days, they couldn't tra trace their uh, daughter who was 10 or 11, you know. So you can imagine how traumatizing it was. Then I said to them, so has this trauma in any way influenced or entered your work? And you know, not only had it not 
entered their work, they hadn't even thought about it. So that is really the question. You know, you look at Hurricane Sandy. One of the districts that hit worst in New York was Chelsea, which is where all the artists are, where the, all the art galleries are. Do you know of any single American painter who's ever tried to confront this? Why not? And the question then becomes, because if they did, that work would be considered illustrative. And illustration is a pejorative in the world of the arts, you know? So that's exactly the kind of derangement that we are in. What is happening to us, we cannot depict because we are forbidden to. Contemporary art and literature is, is partially to blame in, it, in terms of its value system. Very much so, absolutely. And it's a value system that we completely share with uh, so many other aspects of our lives. I mean, you're, you know, you look at Miami Beach. Miami Beach is literally going down in front of our eyes, you know. I mean, the floodwaters come in uh, uh, twice a month on the high tides and so on. And yet, every month, they're building bigger and bigger buildings right on Miami Beach. Bigger, more luxurious buildings. And people, many of them, I'm sure, from Hong Kong, uh, are buying, buying uh, snapping up these buildings. I was just in Chennai, in Madras, uh, uh, you know, and there was this unbelievable flood last year, paralyzed the city, etc. One developer has now got it into his head. He's building this giant, ultra-luxury, sort of uh, super high-rise complex right on the banks of the river that flooded and right next to the sea. And this building will have a seven-story basement, so you tell me, I mean, what is this if not derangement? So one of the solutions or perhaps the, uh, well, I guess it's a sort of solution in, in the book is that you chose to provide literary criticism, if you like, on two documents that were published about climate change. And these were both published in 2015 and you compare and contrast them. And it's very interesting because one is the Paris Agreement on Climate Change and the other is Pope Francis's encyclical letter, Laudato Si, I think, yes. yeah? And of the first, the Paris Agreement, you said that it had not the slightest acknowledgement that something has gone wrong with our dominant paradigms. It contains no clause or article that could be interpreted as a critique of the practices that are known to have created the situation that the agreement seeks to address. So is it that the global political machine has failed us completely? Is that what you're saying? It's completely failed us. We have only to look around to see the utter bankruptcy of our global systems of governance. I mean, what else can you call it? And that's why it was interesting to me to read this uh, Paris Agreement, you know, because after all, I'm not a climate change expert. I'm not a, a technologist or whatever, but I can read. And, you know, <laughs> I, I, I know rhetoric, you know, after all, which is the fundamental craft that we are all trained in. And, uh, you know, luckily for us, uh, fortunately, you, uh, we might say every act of public governance has to be represented in rhetoric so we can read those things. And actually what is so bizarre about the, uh, uh, the COP21 agreement, the Paris Agreement, is that it's, uh, it's an amazing sort of feat of rhetoric. You know, this entire 32-page uh, uh, document has two sentences. You know, clause after clause goes on uh, without, uh, uh, you know, a semicolon after colon after semicolon. We declare, we do this, we do that. And uh, <laughs> two for, so somebody sat in there, you know, dreaming up these great uh, flights of rhetoric. And yet this rhetoric is entirely designed to conceal. You can see that all, you know, throughout the document. And, uh, you know, the papal encyclical, uh, uh, by contrast, is... Exactly the opposite of that. You know, it's a document that strives to sort of open itself, to be clear, to be uh, accessible to the poor, because he's really speaking to, you know, his constituency, which is actually poor people around the world. And you can see that in this document, you know, the way that he strives to frame it. And really the sort of moral passion that is in this, uh, that is in this document and the concern for justice, the concern about really humanity having lost its way. But that's what makes it to me a really, uh, I think, uh, one of the most important documents published in recent times. Well, you, you had me curious. I downloaded it and started reading it. I haven't had a chance to finish it yet. Because one of the things you said it, it, that it, it, you praised it for its sober clarity. And the language is indeed very, it is, it's startling. It's not what I expected. Um, but does that mean that the only leadership that really can do anything for us, at least in words, 
would be a religious leader who is sympathetic to the inequities of you know, what climate change is causing. Um, so what do we do? Do we just say, let us all pray? Is this the answer? Um, uh, look, <laughs> let me say that, uh, you know, uh, uh, I think it was last year or maybe the year before, uh, I was uh, doing a, a talk at, uh, at Oxford and afterwards uh, Chris Patton, who you'll all know, the Lord Patton, uh, he had a dinner for me and we had a very interesting conversation. And I said to him at some point, I said, Lord Patton, would you agree with me when I say that most of the leaders in the democratic world are actually borderline sociopaths? <laughs> and he thought about this for a minute and he says, then he said, yes, I think you're right. <laughs> so I think it's the case, you know. <laughs> you just look at the stuff they do. Look at what Tony Blair has been doing. I mean, you can see that, you know, these people are really borderline sociopaths. So how can you get uh, any kind of, uh, how can you even expect leadership from them? It's, it's not even or any kind of vision. And I really do think that uh, Pope Francis is really the only person speaking in the voice of reason and in the voice of uh, any kind of enlightened leadership. What did you hope to achieve by writing this particular book? Because it is unusual, The Great Derangement. It's not exactly a call to action, but it does suggest some actions for writers or other artists. Uh, what was it you were hoping to achieve with the book? Uh, I can't say that I had any... Uh, you know, I'm not an activist. I don't consider myself that. Uh, I'm not even someone... Uh, you know, I had no sort of uh, determinate set of uh, hopes or, or intentions in writing the book. I just, you know, I, I was voicing uh, doubts and questions that were important for me. But I must say that, uh, you know, the book was just being published in India. And it's clearly been very timely because it's, uh, you know, it met with a, uh, an amazing response, you know, uh, really quite an astonishing response uh, in the press, in the public, uh, everywhere I went. Uh, people really turned out. Uh, you could see that uh, there's a huge interest in the subject, which has just not been addressed as such, you know. And uh, really, in a way, uh, it's. Uh, I, I, I feel very glad that the book has started conversations, you know. I think it will, because, I, you know, after I read it, I had to read it very quickly <laughs> for this uh, session. Um, it got me thinking about ways of addressing the issue in fiction. Certainly the ghost story is one way to think about it. I've started down that track, so I'll see where it goes. So let, let's talk about some other things. Um, universalism and the writer, for example, what we say good literature has to have. You published an interesting essay in 2012, Confessions of a Xenophile. Um, about, in part, it was what drew you to Egypt as a young man. And I'll just read a little something from it. In the West Third World, nationalism is often presented as an ideology of xenophobia and parochialism. But the truth is that many of these movements of resistance tried very hard within their limited means to create an universalism of their own. Those of us who grew up in that period will recall how powerful we Powerfully, we were animated by an emotion that is rarely named. This is xenophilia, the love of the other, the affinity for strangers, a feeling that lives very deep in the human heart, but whose very existence is rarely acknowledged. Um, and you say of yourself in e that you're going to Egypt in 1980 was a kind of xenophilia, a desire to reclaim the globe in my own fashion. Um, so let me ask you, in the English language novel today, are we failing to be truly universal? Can we really be? Well, uh, let me just take a couple of steps back on that. Uh, certainly, uh, you know, I was able to go to Egypt uh, in the, uh, in the uh, late 70s because, essentially, because of the non-aligned movement. You know, the non-aligned movement had set up these sorts of uh, forms of cooperation between Egypt, India, many other countries, which actually made it something possible. That whole mindset now has completely disappeared, you know, in Egypt and in India. I mean, nobody's uh, thinking about that anymore. But uh, there was that window of time when that made it possible. But going beyond that uh, to the literary aspect of it, if I think of, say, uh, the bookshelves that I grew up with, say, my, uh, my uncles, my grandfathers in Calcutta, they read a lot in Bengali, they read uh, sometimes in Sanskrit as well, but they also read a lot in English. Mm -hmm. 
but they didn't necessarily read English novels in English. For them, English was a language which allowed uh, access to translations. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in my uh, uncle's and grandfather's houses, I mean, there would always be Lu Shun, there would be Ivo Andrich, there would be all these, uh, uh, you know, so many different kinds of writers. And, uh, you know, I think this, this wasn't just uh, my family. It's the way that uh, many writers in Asia uh, came of age. I remember meeting uh, a very great Burmese writer uh, called Mia Than Tint. You know, he was one of the greatest uh, uh, Burmese writers of modern times. And uh, I asked him, who were your major influences, you know? And uh, anyone like to guess? No? Very simple. Uh, he said uh, uh, Steinbeck and Gogol. Gogol, yes. You know? And uh, not long after that, I happened to be in Indonesia, and I met Pramodya Anantatua. Oh. And I asked him, I said, who were your major influences? And guess who he said? Uh, Steinbeck and Gogol. Uh, you know, uh, uh, can you imagine a British writer of that, uh, of that same generation saying that, or an American writer? And I was very struck by this when I, uh, when I was an undergrad, uh, you know, rather when I was a, a student at Oxford, that if you went to educated people's houses or, uh, you know, literary people's houses and looked at their bookshelves, their bookshelves would be almost completely uh, books in English. You know, written by English-speaking writers. So this is the strange paradox that, in fact, um, it's the English-speaking world, which today is uh, culturally so dominant and so global. But this world is actually the one that is the most limited, mm. you know, in terms of linguistic influences, in terms of literary influences, uh, in terms even of language. You know, I mean, I, really the last... Uh, Monolingual people left on earth are native-born English speakers because all of us now have to contend with uh, several languages, uh, except if you're born speaking English, you know. So it's a, it's a curious thing that way that, you know, uh, in fact, those of us who were from Asia or Africa or whatever, we did have to contend with a certain kind of cosmopolitanism, which was completely different from, if you like, a Western cosmopolitanism was because growing up here, that's sort of the way I felt. I'll, I'll just raise one other question with you and then turn it over to the audience to see what questions might be there. Um, a Life in Letters, again, 1995, The New Yorker, The Ghosts of Mrs. Gandhi. Um, interesting essay you wrote where you say, when I now read descriptions of troubled parts of the world in which, and I should uh, preface that by saying you were uh, thinking back to uh, being um, in India when Mrs. Gandhi was assassinated and, and, and that you had not written about this and it took you a few years um, before you could write about it. And you said that um, in which violence appears primordial and inevitable, a fate to which masses of people are largely resigned. I find myself asking, is that all there was to it? Or is it possible that the authors of these descriptions failed to find a form or a style or a voice of a plot that it could accommodate both violence and the civilized willed response to it? It is when we think of the world, the aesthetic of indifference might bring into being that we recognize, we recognize the urgency of remembering the stories we have not written. Is this still what keeps you writing? Uh, certainly it's something that I think about a lot because as, you, as you'll have seen, you know, there's a huge temptation now in the world, uh, both as uh, writers and as uh, consumers of writing, that is, as readers, you know, to, uh, uh, to be drawn towards writing from troubled areas or, you know, from troubled parts of the world. But I always remember uh, a friend of mine who was from uh, one of the most troubled parts of the world, that is uh, Kashmir. He was a, a very great poet called Aga Shahid Ali. And I remember him so often saying that if you are from a troubled part of the world and all you have to write about is your trouble, then you're not really a writer at all. You know, there has to be something beyond that. There has to be, you have to find something beyond that. You have to find something which is, uh, uh, which can push past those immediate issues. Okay. Well, I think um, this is about the right time to turn it over to the audience and see um, if anybody has any questions or things you'd like to comment on or to get Amitabh to talk about. Um, does somebody, can somebody provide the microphone? Yeah.
Uh, there's a question. Ah, there's. Uh, thank, thank you for that. Um, this was a, um, a, a comment on what, uh, what I observed, which was uh, a conversation in two parts. In the first part, you were arguing for why you cannot engage the here and now in your fiction. And the second part was a very passionate argument for why you have to engage the here and now in your nonfiction, uh, and in which you castigate artists for not engaging the here and now uh, in, their, uh, in their sort of fiction or art. Can you square that circle for us? Uh, yeah, I'm, uh, see, I'm not, uh, when I said the here and now in the first part, uh, what I was really referring to is, if you like, popular contemporary culture. Uh, in what I was saying in the second part is that, of course, writers have to learn, have to be able to, uh, writers, artists have to be able to respond to immediate experiences. I mean, that's what we are here for. I mean, if your house is going under, underwater, uh, you have to be able to, uh, you have to be able to respond to it in your work as well. So uh, I think the, uh, I think the misunderstanding there lies in what we are thinking of as the here and now. But is there not a difference in temporality? So, for example, if you look at your book, Shadow Lines, you are looking at an historical event through the lens of the here and now, but you are looking at, you're still looking at history. Uh, yes, but actually, you know, in many ways, um, the Shadow Lines was very much about the present. And of course, you're right. I mean, you know, everyone is responding to their uh, circumstances in various ways. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think certainly... As far as the question of uh, climate change concer is concerned and the question of how it affects our lives is concerned, uh, I, I think there really is a question about how in serious literary fiction there is so little contending with it. You know, even amongst writers who are writing about, uh, you know, everyday events and things that are around them. Um, I think we had a, a somebody here up front. Hi. It took a long time for the mic to get here. Well, uh, just as a slight preface, I, I have to say I'm a complete fangirl. I've read most of your, your books, and I absolutely love them. But my question is, why? do you have any thoughts on why it is that uh, some of the greatest uh, literature in English today is being written by people like yourself who are outside what I would call the centers of empire? Uh, unless you count people like, uh, well, no, even even Britain is, of course, no longer a center of empire. Uh, but even but there, I think of people like Kazuo Ishiguro and perhaps Doris Lessing, who is from South Africa, as as being the great lights of of literature there. Why is it, or do you have any thoughts on why is it that empire, particularly the North American one, is not creating great literature today? in English? That's an interesting question, because uh, certainly, uh, you know, uh, the British Empire, I mean, empires have historically created, uh, uh, you know, great literature. The Portuguese Empire, you know, Camões, um, uh, uh, the Lusiads written nearby in Macau, uh, you know, it's almost the foundational text of Portuguese uh, writing. Similarly, you know, uh, one thing you can certainly say about British writers in the early 20th century, I mean, let's leave aside Kipling, but there was, uh, you know, there was Forster. Uh, there were so many others uh, who wrote in really interesting ways about uh, this relationship. Uh, I think one of the, one very much neglected writer is uh, Louis Cooperus, uh, you know, a Dutch writer who wrote about Indonesia in the 20s. Uh, his book, The Hidden Force, is, uh, to my mind, really, uh, the greatest of the colonial novels. Uh, but this is, this is certainly an interesting paradox. The American empire has produced almost nothing, uh, you know, uh, on, on these subjects. I suppose you could say Malcolm Lowry uh, wrote about Mexico and so on. But uh, other than that, I really wonder who we would say. Uh, you know, at the end of his life, John Updike wrote a book called The Terrorist, but it's actually set in New York, and it's about an Arab boy who becomes radicalized and so on. It is just about the most terrible novel uh, ever written. I mean, uh, I, I was given the sorry duty of uh, having to review it. And I tell you, it was embarrassing how bad it was. And it really showed up how terrible his writing was in general. I mean, uh, you know. 
And it really makes you wonder why why was this guy so celebrated and fetishized? I mean, uh, you know. So I I, I don't know what to tell you. I mean, uh, Norman Rush has written a really great novel, I would say, about South Africa. Uh, It's called Mating. So you can see that, you know, American writers have suddenly become very aware of their limited uh, horizon and are trying to reach beyond it. But uh, has it been successful? I think apart from mating, I really can't think of... Uh, can you? The North Korean novel um, that won the Pulitzer, um, John, mm. Adam Johnson's book. Uh, was, certainly. Was, and, was looking beyond. Yeah. And then we, we do have writers like Juno Diaz and, you know, people like that. But again, that's not the center. Uh, his book was really quite uh, Oh, Juno Diaz's book, I think, is superb. But again, he's writing... I think it's important to recognize that uh, a lot of the writers you're speaking of are actually writing about uh, the migration experience. You know, so the process of being assimilated into America or Britain or whatever, that's not really writing about the world. It's, it's really a sort of rewriting of the Jewish fiction of the 20s and 30s, you know, of Joseph Roth and so on. I also think American fiction is very um, concerned with America itself. Yeah. That's what most American fiction is. Yeah. Other questions? There's somebody here. Um, I loved what you said earlier about it's the people stupid. Um, and I was just wondering, it relates to the earlier question. Do you think that's one of the reasons Indian writing in English has become so popular? Because Indians have this undying curiosity about other people. And perhaps this is one way in which that vice has actually become a virtue, that curiosity about other people has translated to good fiction. I think you're absolutely right. I really think that, uh, you know, the reason why people read Indian writing uh, is because uh, it has this quality of being engaged with people. You know, Indian writing uh, to this day, uh, you know, of my generation, I must say, I mean, one of its great strengths is that it writes about the important things you know, about life, love, death, uh, family, separation, uh, you know, those things. And it writes about them uh, in the language of emotion, in the language of passion, you know. Whereas if you read uh, so much of contemporary Western fiction, it's so ironicized, uh, you know. I mean, it's, it's written in such a voice of such high irony that in a way uh, it loses the reader. You know, it's no longer able to address these very primal things that people, um, you know, connect with. So if you read a lot of Indian fiction, it's probably for that reason, because it's uh, addressing those things unashamedly. Other questions? Ah. Ah. No more questions? Uh, it's so interesting because uh, people always say that audiences in China are quiet. I didn't find that at all. They were uh, in mainland China. China. They were <laughs> so, they had so many questions. But uh, I'm always glad to do without. This, this one here. We, we, we have questions. Um, I, I've been thinking about this issue of global warming for some time. And I also felt such passion that about the fact that the, the literature is not reflecting this. And I just wonder, is it possible that our language has not evolved to the state that allows us to speak in this way? Yes, and one very good example of that is that, uh, you know, how limited our vocabulary is in relation to these events. Uh, for example, just take the word nature. Really, what does nature mean? Uh, I mean, nature is an idea that comes into being in the late 18th century. And really, it, the idea is that nature is everything that I am not, that the human I is not. But when we, de- when we look at climate change, actually, you cannot make that distinction anymore because these events that are happening, we have set them in motion. You know, uh, there, is, uh, there is no longer a nature which is outside us. We are completely within this set of causalities. So even there, I mean, how do you... Uh, how do you make, uh, how do you introduce the words? You're sort of trapped into using words like natural or environmental or whatever, whereas these words actually have no purchase in relation to our new reality. Can I ask you about your comment on climate change? Uh, You said that the Paris Accord is full of rhetoric. And Pope Francis's letter actually talks about and recognizes the problem. 
But wouldn't you agree that the Paris Accord is the first tangible document that the whole global community has signed on to? First of all, recognizing the fact that there is a problem. And second of all, setting itself targets, setting itself timeframes, and setting itself a fund which is going to be used to um, help out the countries that actually adhere to that. So isn't that a little more than rhetoric, really? Good question. Uh, look, um, I think uh, certainly, uh, you know, since we were speaking in, the, um, uh, in an abbreviated way, uh, I, I would, uh, there are certain, there are, uh, the Paris Agreement does represent uh, certain achievements. One is that it, it has set in stone the acknowledgement globally that the findings of climate change are real, that climate change is human-induced, and this is a very important thing. I mean, in fact, now denialism is bound to be a minority position. So that is a very important achievement, no doubt. Similarly, getting 190 countries or whatever to sign on is an important achievement. But let us not forget that, in fact, there was a Kyoto Protocol, which did bring together the great majority of the world's countries, with the exception of the United States and Australia. So it's not as if uh, the world had not recognized that these things were happening. I mean, what happened is that two or three countries deliberately wrecked that agreement. If you look at this agreement and compare it with the Kyoto Protocol or even the Framework Cl Convention on Climate Change, it's striking how different the language is. You know, in the Kyoto Protocol, there is talk about, at least in some minor way, an acknowledgement of market failure. You know, I mean, that's not a very big thing to concede, but at least it was there. There is no such thing in the, in the Paris Agreement. Uh, similarly, there was talk of environmental justice. You're talking about this, uh, this fund that has been set up, essentially a charity fund which exists at the will of the West. But what this agreement also does is that it completely sweeps the question of environmental justice under the rug. The only time that justice is mentioned in the, in the Paris Agreement, it's, it's this very weird sentence, weirdly constructed sentence, which says, the issue of, let us acknowledge that the issue of environmental justice is of importance to some. Can you imagine? Uh, I, I, other than that, there is no mention of justice. Quite to the contrary, the only perfectly, pellucidly clear sentence in this entire agreement is the one that says there is never going to be any uh, acceptance of reparations in the future. So there you have it. You know, in place of the reparations that really um, island nations, etc., should be able to demand, what we have is this charity fund. How will it be dispersed? Who will, uh, who will look after it? If you read this agreement, really, it's extraordinary how opaque the language is. You know, there's this whole section in it which talks about appointing champions. You know, the, the agreement will appoint these champions. And who are these champions? Where have they championed? You know, what have they won in their champion? It's bizarre. You can see that what it is actually is that it's a bunch of people who have uh, laid claim to this issue and who are going to appoint each other, you know, to various positions. Providing jobs to each other for a while. <laughs> That's what it is. It's the new liberalization of climate change. That is what we have here. Hi, thank you very much. Can I ask two questions, actually? Um, who have been your greatest literary influences? You, you talked a lot about the filmmaker Ray, but we didn't, you didn't actually discuss who've had the biggest impact on you. And secondly, possibly related, what, if anything, do you read for light relief when you want to switch <laughs> off and just read something for the, the sheer hell of it? Uh, good question. Um, you know... Ray was also a writer. Uh, he wrote children's stories, uh, and they were very uh, influential. So I grew up reading those stories as well. Uh, you know, it's very difficult for me to uh, answer the question of, um, you know, uh, the, the great influences, because uh, my background was uh, as a bilingual. So I grew up, and really the background of Bengali culture is bilingual. So, for example, there's a wonderful Bengali writer called Shorodindu Bandopadhyay. None of you will have heard of him, but... Uh, he wrote these wonderful children's stories, uh, which were historical. Uh, but he, in turn, was influenced by Walter Scott, uh, you know. I, I, and I love Walter Scott, <laughs> you know. Uh, so there are these sort of multiple sort of roadways of influence uh, that, um, you know, uh, spiral through the ages. Uh, 
Uh, you asked also, uh, uh, what am I reading now? Uh, what do I read for uh, light reading? You know, I, I've really got, gotten into reading um, uh, pre-modern Chinese writing. I, I find it really, really interesting. I'm reading this wonderful book now called Mirage. Uh, what's the Chinese name, uh, uh, Tan Sen? Uh, I'm forgetting. Uh, it's translated by uh, a translator called Patrick Mannon, and it's, a, it's an 18th century novel set in Guangzhou, and it's a really interesting novel. This one, I'll have to go look for it, yeah. Um, I found it very interesting when you talked about xenophilia, because we often hear about xenophobia, fear of the other, etc. And um, I'm wondering, uh, do you foresee some type of renaissance of xenophilia? Because when people talk about xenophobia or fear of the other, then maybe create some type of literature that pertains to a particular audience, etc. That doesn't necessarily include the other or other worlds or other ideologies. Would a renaissance of xenophilia perhaps do that and allow readers to enter di different worlds? Uh, good question. You know, I think writers have always written uh, to some degree about xenophilia, you know. Um, and of course, I use the word xenophilia simply because everyone assumes that the normal human condition is one of xenophobia, which I don't think is the case. You know, I mean, certainly, uh, you know, reading the correspondences of Chinese merchants in the 19th century uh, with English merchants, with Indian merchants, you can see the deep and close ties that they had, uh, you know. Um, so I think these... Uh, these uh, these friendships, these associations have always existed and, uh, you know, existed in very powerful and important ways. And they've often manifested themselves in, uh, in writing. Uh, in uh, Melville's uh, uh, Moby Dick, for example, if you read the 40th chapter, you'll see that the crew of the, uh, of the Pequod actually consists of like 30 or 40 nationalities, you know, and they all, <laughs> they all end up singing together. Uh, in an, you know, so... Uh, you know, you see traces of that in literature uh, uh, for centuries. Actually, one of the things you did say in that same essay was that in matters of, you, you said that many people have actually become xenophiles, that in matters of language, culture, and civilization is fragmented, fissured, and incomplete. Only when our work begins to embody the conflicts, the pain, the laughter, and the yearning that comes from this incompleteness will our work be a true mirror of the world we live in? So I think that was a rather interesting point you made in that essay. Yes, well, you look around this room. I mean, uh, how many of us are married to, you know, people from cultures other than our own, you know? I mean, uh, uh, there, there already you see what xenophilia is. You mentioned that you've been to China often and uh, how interested you are in uh, that, that era. I wonder what your opinion is in all these visits about how China perceives um, their relations with India. I remember going to P Peking University and somebody asking, well, what do the Chinese think of India? And the person on the stage said they don't. Um, so just your comments on that. And also you said you love research. I wonder if you've been to Nalanda University and what you think of that whole project. Uh, well, the first part first. Um, uh, you know, I had never been to China before, um, before I started writing Sea of Poppies. Uh, I'd had no interest in China. Uh, it's a strange thing to say, uh, you know, but uh, I'm typical of Indians, uh, you know, of, of India. I grew, you know, I studied in India um, and so on. But China never existed on our horizon, really. I mean, not as a place. It existed as some sort of uh, a scary idea, you know, but uh, uh, never as, as anything, as any sort of real place where people lived, you know. So the first time I came to China was when I started uh, doing the research for uh, Sea of Poppies in 2004. And I must say, it was a complete revelation. Uh, it was, an, I mean, as, as China always is for people who haven't been. Uh, it was a complete revelation. Uh, you know, I was by my, I was on my own. I didn't know a word of uh, um, Chinese or, for that matter, of Cantonese. And I was in uh, Guangzhou uh, on, on my own. But uh, it was a wonderful experience, uh, you know. 
So the question of what uh, Chinese people uh, think of India, I think it's it's a mirror of what Indians uh, think about China. They don't, <laughs> except as uh, some, uh, you know. And to me, this is actually really the issue, you know, that India and China share, uh, what is it, a thousand mile border. Uh, we've lived next to each other for millennia, and we will always live next to each other because you can't change geography. But really, uh, contemporary Indians, I mean, they'll know about Latin America, they'll know about Australia, they'll know about Africa, but they won't know about, uh, about China. And I think <coughs> the same is true the other way around. And this is, you know, to me, it's not surprising that neighbors have problems because neighbors always have problems. But neighbors... Uh, Neighbors usually have problems because they know each other. You know, they know each other. <laughs> they know each other's strong points and bad points and so on. But in the case of India and China, it's a unique case of where there's uh, uh, this uh, sort of Himalaya of the mind, you know, mm -hmm. where nothing is perceivable on one side and the other. And yet, uh, what is happening in the climate change area, they, they seem to be working together and have a common point of view. Do you find that interesting, that... Uh, that views have been uh, shared in some ways and not shared in others. And certainly the ways in which uh, uh, China is tackling the issue and the ways in which India is tackling the issue are completely different. So I, I can't really speak to that. Yeah. Uh, there was a question here. Yes, yes, thank you. I have a question about style, style of uh, writing and style of speech. I've not read your work yet. I now intend to but I've been so impressed in listening to you this evening of the utter clarity and directness of the way in which you speak. Um, I come from the academic world where, shall we say, um, if we put it kindly, complexity and sophistication, or if we put it unkindly, um, obscurantism and jargon are much more favored forms of writing. And I wondered if you could talk about this style. Are you aware of how clearly uh, you, you speak, how straightforward, direct, and yet profound your, your style of speaking is, and whether you find when you write nonfiction, you write differently than when you write fiction. Are there different styles and different levels of complexity that you feel you have to employ? Well, thank you for, <laughs> very much for that. I must say it comes as a complete surprise to me because I always think of myself as speaking very incoherently. And uh, every time, uh, you know, sometimes you do those interviews where they send you the transcript and I look at it and I think, oh my God, I, was, was I speaking like this? It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. So uh, I'm, really, I'm really reassured to hear you say that. Uh, about, uh, about fiction and nonfiction, fiction and nonfiction are two completely different registers in my mind. You know, uh, they engage different parts of your head, they dif engage different parts of yourself. And to me, uh, certainly uh, writing fiction is by an order of magnitude more difficult than writing nonfiction. It's because language functions in, in such a complex way when you're writing fiction. You know, it's doing so many more things. Uh, in nonfiction, the only thing you have to worry about is about being able to put across what you're trying to say. But in, uh, in fiction, you're trying to create also mood and uh, setting and place and, you know, so many other things. So uh, uh, fiction is, for me, very much more difficult, but also very much more rewarding. You know, at the end of a day of writing fiction, uh, there's a sort of contentment, a yes, pleasure, you know, <laughs> uh, which uh, simply doesn't exist in writing nonfiction. <laughs> uh, at least not in the same way. Would you, wouldn't you I, say? I think that's true because I write both. I think with nonfiction, I'm relieved when the day is over. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly, yes. And there was a question somewhere there. Every time I go back to India, I see bookshelves lined with Indian fiction. Why is it that Indian writers are only writing about India? I mean, why not about anything else? Why is it only about what young men and women are up to in India, or uh, something to do with politics in India, or spy thrillers like the kinds uh, Mukul Deva writes, which is all about Pakistan? Why have not Indian writers evolved outside India or thinking India? It's so interesting that you say that because, uh, you know, when I was in, uh, just now uh, spending this time in, uh, in uh, mainland China, 
So many of the journalists have said to me that uh, actually the difference between Chinese and Indian fiction is that Indian fiction is full of global engagements. <laughs> So I, I think it depends on which writers you choose to read. Hi. Oh, <clears throat> um, thank you for that. I am um, I'm a young writer. If I don't look young, I am young. Um, <laughs> but I actually had two questions. One is, um, I guess, well, I I understand that a lot of readers and writers ask you if you've written in Bengali first before you wrote, before they're translated into English because they sound translated sometimes, the experience, et cetera. But I think, I guess, well, my experience is, I remember the first time I went to the States for school, I wrote a short story about, uh, based on my family, but it was a fictional story. And a girl in my class said, why can't you just write about anything else except for Asia? And I thought about it, and then for the next four years, I tried to write white people for a very long time, and I couldn't do it because I, I just like never lived in a suburb suburban home, so I was writing these backyards that never existed in my mind. But I guess like for you, why write in English, or have you ever felt that that language doesn't belong to you, or the language you're writing in doesn't belong to the genre or the content you're portraying, or I guess if it feels mismatched, or if you feel like you're translating almost. Um, and the second question is, when you do research for fiction, um, I've been told a lot of times that when you do research, you do the research, and then you set it aside, and then you write. And is that what you think is the relationship between research and writing fiction, or do you continuously do it throughout the process of writing? <laughs> 